every time I watch Confessions of a Shopaholic, I think one thing. I want that coat. No, actually two things. The coat and that it's actually a pretty inspiring story for a silly movie about shopping. I love that Confessions of a Shopaholic shows main character Rebecca Bloomwood at rock bottom. Her love of fashion led her deep into credit card debt and a shopping addiction. But the same love that brought her to her lowest point is what she eventually uses to pull herself back up and create a new, better life for herself. So let's set the scene. The story centers on Becky, who's a 20-something-year-old shopping addict living in New York City. She works as a journalist for a gardening magazine, and she's not exactly passionate about it. And that's because her real dream is to work for the major fashion magazine, Alette. And Rebecca loves fashion. She has an emotional connection to shopping stemming from her childhood, but this has led to an addiction that she is completely in denial about. Declined. Really? Could you just, could you try it again? Really declined. She eventually snags an interview for her dream job, but when she shows up to Alette, the position has already been filled. She's then offered an interview at a finance magazine instead. To make matters worse, she finds out upon her return to the office that the gardening magazine is shutting down. Desperate for work, she accepts the job at Successful Savings, and the problem, of course, is that Rebecca knows nothing about finances and absolutely nothing about saving. But she realizes that while she doesn't understand finances from a healthy point of view, she still has a lot of perspective on the pitfalls of finances. She is, after all, thousands of dollars in credit card debt. And so she starts writing her articles based in her love of fashion and her knowledge of what not to do. Comparing high interest store cards to cheap sweaters. Your store card is like a 50% off cashmere coat. The first time you meet, it promises to be your best friend. Until you look closely and realize it's not real cashmere. You've been ripped off. Right, you get it? You get it. We get it. Now go away. And this eventually gains her TV appearances and more recognition than she's ever gotten before. And it's all because of her passions and the perspective that she gained at rock bottom that give her an edge. She can discuss finances in a way that everybody can understand, but because of her unique insight, few people in that industry would think to write from this unstuffy, relatable angle. It's only because she was in debt, unemployed, and desperate that she took a job that she wasn't traditionally right for. And it's only because she wasn't traditionally right for the job that she was able to bring a fresh perspective and new voice into a space that wasn't particularly accepting towards her. And it really goes to show that you don't need to change yourself to succeed. You just need to direct your passions into something that empowers you. Corny, I know, but it's true. And something similar happens in Legally Blonde. The iconic Elle Woods is dumped by the man that she thought she was going to marry and is at a low point. So low that she chases this man across the country, acting completely out of character and landing herself in unfamiliar territory. But the second she takes her life back and focuses on what she wants instead of how to get Warner back, she finds herself gaining confidence as she navigates this new world successfully. She's an anomaly in her class, but instead of shrinking back to California, she embraces her differences. And when she finally wins her trial, we realize that it's because of her unique perspective and her otherness. She is the only one who could have won this case. Tony, why is it that Tracy Marcinko's curls were ruined when she got hosed down? Because they got wet? Exactly. Because isn't it the first cardinal rule of perm maintenance that you're forbidden to wet your hair for at least 24 hours after getting a perm, at the risk of deactivating the ammonium thyglocolate? Her classmates had thought that she was a vain, blonde airhead, but in the end, she did what none of them could do. And just like how Rebecca Bloomwood's rock bottom and shopping addiction led her to having the perspective to write financial articles in a fresh new way, Elle Woods, at her lowest point, found a way to use her passions and special interests to empower herself. And in the end, being the odd woman out was actually her biggest strength, not her weakness. And neither Rebecca or Elle would have been nearly as happy had they gotten what they had originally wanted. Elle would have ended up in a relationship with a man who didn't respect her, and Rebecca would have gotten deeper and deeper in debt trying to keep up with the fashion of the other Alette girls. They needed to hit rock bottom to get off the wrong path and get onto the right one. If you're thinking, okay, but those are movies, how do we implement this into our own lives? Well, let's look at real life example Coco Chanel, and Coco's story has been hotly debated because she was notoriously a bit of a liar, so it's hard to know exactly what the truth of her story is. 
That said, I'm just going to share the most widely available telling of her story. So Coco was born in France as the illegitimate daughter of a laundry woman and a street vendor who made his money selling clothes, a far cry from the sophistication that she was known for. After her mother died when Coco was just 11 years old, she was sent to an orphanage. And here she learned to sew, and this earned her work as a seamstress, which eventually opened the door to her creating her own design. Eventually, a married man who kept Coco as his mistress opened a hat shop for her to keep her busy and out of his hair. But Coco put her all into this shop, and what was meant to be a silly hobby became a booming business with Coco's ambition and skill. She was given an opportunity and she maximized its potential through sheer willpower and the hunger of creating a better life for herself. And Coco's poverty-stricken childhood was great inspiration for her designs. This was in a time where women in high society were wearing corsets and skirts made of heavy fabrics. Everything was very proper and stiff, but Coco was a rebel. She had developed shrewd survival skills growing up abandoned and impoverished, and she was able to be a chameleon and fit in with wealthy people despite it being a foreign world to her. Shortly after her hat business had started taking off, there was a shortage of materials that had traditionally been used for women's fashion due to the war. And this is when Coco had her second stroke of luck. She started making dresses out of jersey, which at the time was almost exclusively used to make men's underwear and was seen as too ordinary for couture. But wealthy women began to commission Coco to make them jersey dresses as well, and these garments allowed women a lot more freedom of movement and were more practical for daily wear than the rest of the market. At the time, women were trapped in corsets, and fashion was restrictive for women. They couldn't eat, they couldn't breathe. Coco Chanel changed all of that. She looked at it and said, this isn't how a modern woman should dress. This is how men dress us. Her unique perspective was needed to have this rebellious vision for how women could be, and her hard work and ambition were needed to see this vision through. Because of her mother's work doing laundry and her father's job selling clothes on the street, she was able to recognize the usefulness of unpopular, unglamorous materials. A designer who had been raised in wealth likely wouldn't have conceptualized using the silhouettes and fabrics that Coco had popularized. And despite rejecting much of her past, she was heavily inspired by her working class upbringing. And these aspects were reflected in her designs. The crisp, loose uniforms of the nuns who raised her, a sailor's tricot, a ditch digger's scarf, waitressing uniforms, mechanics, button-ups, they were all used as influences in her clothes. And she even popularized menswear like slacks and sweaters for women, making them chic when previously women in men's clothes could have been seen as crass. And of course, there is a lot to be said about her later involvement in World War II, but that doesn't take away from the inspiration from her early story. One last example, a more modern visionary with a significantly less controversial past than Coco, Hankook Kim, the founder of Gentle Monster. Kim had an eye for design and was becoming increasingly more interested in creating eyewear. But there was a huge problem. The eyewear market is completely monopolized by the company Luxottica, which owns everything from Oakley to Prada to lens crafters and sunglass hut. He was so passionate, though, that he gave it a try knowing that failure was likely. And he did. Fail, that is. Before long, he couldn't afford to pay his employees. And this had a lot to do with the fact that he couldn't get his glasses into retail stores. They were only interested in Luxottica products. And unfortunately, his online store was a money pit. The store ate the cost of both shipping and returns, and this was really costing the company. He wasn't giving up, though. Instead of quitting, he persisted and pivoted. He got a wealthy friend to partner with him, and instead of going back to the same business model, he realized he needed to try a different route. He found a gap in the market and worked his way in where Luxottica had turned a blind eye. Luxottica, at the time, was neglecting to make extra-large sunglasses as they weren't trending in Western markets, but Kim knew that he could use this to get his foot in the door. He played into Korean beauty standards for women, creating these huge sunglasses that made women's faces appear to be more petite. And doing this, he basically became an overnight sensation. But he wasn't done. Since he previously been rejected from retailers who were focused on selling Luxottica brands, he opened his own stores. He used his love of design to stand out, filling his stores with art and animatronics, drawing in customers who were interested in the art that he was showcasing but fell in love with the eyewear while they were exploring the store. 
He collaborated with celebrities and brands, creating sunglasses that are experimental art pieces, transcending Luxottica's average designs altogether. He made Gentle Monster into an exciting, unpredictable brand with fresh, innovative ideas. And people want to be a part of the experience that he's created. And this would have never happened had his first business model succeeded. And since, he has expanded to both cosmetics and artistic desserts. Everything Kim does is new, fresh, and never been done before. Talented, brilliant, incredible, amazing, show-stopping. Because he wasn't bound by the same traditional mindsets that others in the market were. All that said, I think anyone who finds themselves at rock bottom can use it as an opportunity to explore their passions in a way that empowers themselves and others. Easier said than done, of course, but not impossible. And on that note, if you enjoyed this video, stay tuned for more video essays and pop culture analysis as I grow my channel. I love making these videos and sharing them with you, and if you want to see more from me, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!